All right, hi everyone. My name is Abby and I'm going to be tonight's speaker. Um, tonight's topic will be assistive technology tips and tools. Um, and as Allison was saying earlier, this at the bottom, this tiny URL is how you can access my slides. It'll bring you automatically right into presenter mode so you can see exactly what I'm seeing. Um, this is case sensitive, so make sure you don't put any capitalizations in the AT tips and tricks. So a little bit about me. Um, I graduated from Boston University in 2018. Throughout my time there, I catered my grad school experience to focus on augmentative and alternative communication, um, as well as assistive technology. I now currently work at Valley Collaborative in Billerica, Massachusetts, um, and I work with students in our elementary, middle, and high school program, including students in our transitional program from the ages of 18 to 22. In addition to that, I um, do some consultation work in AT and AAC for our member districts within the Merrimack Valley. So I go in and I work with the teams and help problem solve some assistive tech and AAC problems. I am currently working towards my assistive technology practitioner's license and hopefully by the end of 2020, we'll be licensed. All I have left to do is take my test, which is very exciting to almost be done with that. So we're gonna start off with a little bit of a poll. Our first poll is going to be, what profession do you work in? And I'm gonna give everybody about 30 seconds to answer and then we'll just look at a breakdown. So that is actually perfect because I work in a school, so a lot of the tips and tricks that I have for you guys are going to be school-based. So here is today's outline. I am hoping to get through it all. And if I'm not able to, then the slides will still be available and I'm always available via email for questions. Um, our last poll question, just to help me get an understanding of everyone's experience levels, is what experience level do you have with AAC and AT? So it looks like the majority of our audience is in that minimal to moderate range. Awesome. So just a quick little outline of what we're going to do today. We're going to start with talking about the differences between assistive technology and augmentative and alternative communication. Um, low, we're going to go over some low and mid tech options, and then we're going to break out and do some question and answers, and then go into Google Chrome extensions, Chromebook accessibilities, iOS features, Google Read and Write, and then at the very end, we'll do another set of question and answers. So, assistive technology is any piece of equipment, software program, or product system that is used to increase, maintain, or improve the functional capabilities of a person with disabilities. So I like to think of assistive technology as this giant umbrella that encompasses all these different areas and all these different specialties um, in our professions. So just one small part of AT is augmentative and alternative communication. And um, augmentative and alternative communication is a scope of practice within the field of speech language pathology falling under this assistive tech umbrella. It includes, includes all forms of communication other than oral speech that are used to express thoughts, needs, wants, and ideas. So because I'm an SLP, a lot of the time, some, the AT that I am doing is AAC related, but I'm slowly branching out and learning so much more about all of these cross-discipline areas within assistive technology. So assist, when we think of assistive technology, people kind of have tunnel vision on what it is. And I really think that has a lot to do with what scope of practice we are working in. So when I first thought of assistive technology, all I thought about was AAC. But really, there are so many other things encompassed within assistive technology, from study skills to vision and hearing, um, even some executive functioning skills. And I typically work with the assistive tech that is language-based in some way. So I do a lot with writing, reading, AAC, things like that. So here are just a few quick examples of some assistive technology. Low tech can be communication boards, some hardware can be prosthetics or mounting systems, computer hardware could be specialized keyboards or switches. Computer software could be screen readers or individual computer communication programs, inclusive or specialized curriculum aids, built-in vision accessibility on iOS is a great example of vision accommodations, and so, so much more. All the way from the really expensive power wheelchairs all the way down to a simple pencil holder. 
So this, what's really cool about assistive technology is that it's continually growing and changing, both for the good and for the bad. So it's really important that we stay on top of all of the new assistive tech that comes out, but to also be wary of new technology. So one thing I am seeing a lot lately is that people are creating extensions and apps and all of these things that we can use with our students, but they have no hold in it anywhere. So they just create it. And then a lot of the times they just say they're done and they don't continue to support it. They don't continue to problem solve and work things through this. So we've actually saw this recently during our virtual learning time. We were using a Google Chrome extension to create a grid view within Google Meet. And it was just some random guy had created it. It worked amazing. But then based on some Chrome updates, it stopped working. And the guys basically said, I don't feel like supporting this anymore. I'm not going to. So that extension no longer worked. And a lot of us were without the ability to see our students during our sessions. Thankfully, within that same week, Google Chrome, I mean, Google Meet came out with their own similar version. So now we're back to being able to see our students again. So some examples of AT within the school setting. We've talked about some Chrome extensions, switches and switch adapted tools, adapted cooking utensils, co-writer and other writing support tools, and built-in iOS on an iPad or iPhone, Wordmaker Online, and Boom Cards. So I've only been at Valley two years, but I have been really trying to take on creating this multimodal AT environment within the schools, especially with some of my higher need classrooms. So one of the classrooms I work in is our intensive special needs program. So within this program, we have students who have um, significant medical and communication needs um, and access the curriculum in a variety of different ways. So this right here is just an example of something that we have been using that is multimodal AT. So every week, our students have a question of the week and we go through, we talk about the questions and we talk about the answers. And then we program their step-by-steps, which is a tool I'll be showing you guys later on. And it allows the students to go in the hallway and interact with their peers and other staff members to ask this question. So we have four kids in the classroom. One student is in charge of asking if they would like to participate in the survey. Another student is in charge of asking the question. A third student is in charge of ask, giving everyone the answers. And then a fourth one, if you look on the bottom down here is this graph, was made on Boardmaker Online, he is taking data as we are going. So he's getting that real-time feedback um, on the data that he is taking. So then we come back to the classroom and we pull this graph up on Boardmaker Online on our smart boards and we talk about more and less and the biggest and the smallest and all these great vocabulary terms. And what's great is when it's on the smart board, I can just click it and it'll read the numbers back to us. So, you know, 14 people liked dogs, and our students are able to independently complete this activity. What I think the greatest feature of this is that it's getting our students out in the hallway and interacting with the peers. Even though we are a special education collaborative and all of our students there are on IEPs, sometimes this particular classroom is a little overwhelming for our other students. A lot of our students have trachs or have limb differences, and they can be kind of hard for our other students to approach them. And this is just opening that door for them, both students and staff, to interact with our ISN students. All right, we are going to go over some low and mid tech options. So when I'm talking about low tech options, I am talking about things that don't require a power source at all. When I'm talking about mid tech options are things that require a battery, but not rechargeable. So I'm actually going to turn my camera on so you guys can see. So this first thing that we have are called page fluffers. So what page fluffers are, are they create space between pages of the book. So this is what the book would typically look like. But with page fluffers, it gives students an area to be able to reach in and independently turn the pages themselves. So for this particular page fluffer, I am using the soft side of Velcro dots. Another way you can use page fluffers is with 
um, just dots of hot glue. So today I went through and added some dots of hot glue and this creates an even bigger space between the pages. So the students are then able to independently flip through the pages. This is also great for little kids too who maybe don't have the fine motor skills to be able to independently turn the pages of the book. And then the last type are just pom-poms, these are actually cotton balls, on paper clips. And this just provides a simple way for a student to grab each page and turn. So those are just three different quick options to adapt books to meet our student needs. Another one is a glove with the finger cut off. So what this does, I put it on, only my fingertip is going to stick out of it. So when I'm using an iPad, I can lay my whole hand on the screen and it's not going to interact until I touch with my one open finger. And this is great for students who have some access difficulties or just need to be able to brace themselves within the screen and on that screen. And another super simple one is just laminated index cards. This allows the student to be able to read along and keep their eyes along that single line of text while they're reading. Another awesome mainstream ATA tool that I love are pop sockets. And I feel like every student now has them, so putting it on a student's device is just part of the norm. It's not something that makes them different. It's not something that they feel that makes them stand out. All a pop socket does is it pops out and provides a grip to hold on to a phone. You can stick two or three of them on an iPad and they're super easy to pop on and off as needed and they've got lots of cool little designs on it. And this um, back on the screen on the right side is called a boogie board and a boogie board is kind of a higher tech whiteboard. So it allows you to write on that black surface as if it was a whiteboard, but there is none of the smudging or the dust that comes along with a whiteboard. So you just use it as needed, and then when you're done, you hit the button at the top, and it quickly erases the whole board for you. Um, they come in paper size and iPhone size, so it's great for students who just need maybe some visual reminders throughout the day or who need to use it to take notes throughout an entire class. Um, there is an app that goes along with it. I have yet to be able to make it work. Um, I just find it super glitchy and not consistent, and it's not something I would ever recommend to a student until they work out some bugs with it. Another fun little low-tech option are core boards. So I have two different versions of core boards. Our first one, I have a high contrast core board for when we take our students swimming. So the staff and I can model on it. He could point if he wanted to. Um, and it just has basic, simple core words and phrases that are related to swimming. Another core board that I use frequently, especially during virtual learning, are these giant wall core boards. And all that we did was we used an editing software from TouchChat and took a screenshot and then sent it over to Staples and they just printed it as if it was a poster. Um, we have these up in different classrooms throughout the collaborative and it provides our students the option to use their device, to use their verbal speech, to point on the core board. Um, and especially my younger kids really just seem to enjoy to be able to come up to the board throughout the class and use the core board. Um, we have a smaller versions available for the students at their desks as well at all times. Some other options are math manipulatives. These could be little counting bears or blocks um, and also slant boards. So what a slant board does is it just provides a slight incline to put a device on top of. So these are actually from Ikea. I think they were like three dollars. It's actually technically a laptop stand, but now when a student uses the device, they it's at an appropriate angle for them to use. We have a number of slant boards throughout our school and each one is customized to each student. So this is one that I just bought off the shelf 
um, but it has worked for some kids, especially during avals. Um, we have other slant boards that are desktop style, other ones that go all the way down to the floor. And it just, it also reminds the student that this is where their voice is. So if they walk away to go play with a toy, they know that their device is always on their slant board and they can always come back to it. Another big one is rulers. Just like the laminated index card, you can use it as kind of a placeholder to see where you are reading each line for a student to follow along as they're being read to or if they're independently reading. And highlighters. I feel like highlighters are kind of a way of the past now that all this technology exists, people kind of forget they exist. Um, so I like to use highlighters with some of my students who have difficulty with executive functioning skills. So we'll teach them that a green highlight means vocab, a yellow highlight means an important fact, and a pink highlight means, come back to this, I have a question. So then as they're reading, they're highlighting and color coding, and then when they're going back to study, they can use those highlights to remember the vocabulary words, the main points, and to look up further questions. There's a pretty cool feature on Google Read and Write that actually takes these highlights and pulls them into a document for you and hopefully we'll be able to show you that later on. Another really cool piece of assistive tech is called an easy hold. And easy holds are just these silicone bands right here and they slip. You can slip just about anything inside of them. So you can slip a pencil inside an easy hold. and it creates a custom handle for your students to use. You can use it with utensils, with musical instruments like drumsticks, paintbrushes, markers. And this lovely lady right here is actually my sister, which is why her face is not blocked out. I have her permission. Um, one of our favorite things to do together is to go to paint nights together. And one of the challenges that we were having in the beginning is she wanted to do hand over hand and if she gets really excited, her tone increases, which then makes it even harder for me to control her hand and her arm and her shoulder in order for us to be able to paint. So with these easy holds, I know that no matter what, she's going to have a grip on that paintbrush. Even if she opens her hands, it's going to stay there and it's not going to fly into my face. Um, so then I can just focus on using her wrist to help her paint. Uh, we currently have an entire wall dedicated to Maggie's paintings. Um, She's the sassiest human, I think, that exists on this planet, so God forbid we take any of them down. Um, but she likes to use these as well if we're playing a board game. We have stuck a Yahtzee cube on a wooden spoon, so then she can shake the spoon, which shakes the, the box, which shakes the dice, and then she rolls them. Um, another pretty simple solution are non-slip shelf liners. Um, and it keeps things from moving around. It's that grid patterned shelf liner and you put it underneath whatever you want to not slide around. And it can also be found, if you're lucky, at the dollar store. Another thing that works similar to this are sometimes they sell placemats that are made of that same non-slip material. Um, and those ones can also be found at the dollar store. So one of my favorite, favorite, favorite things to use in therapy are books, as you can probably tell by all of the physically adapted books I have made. But we can also adapt the content to be, help our students out. So my favorite ways to adapt books um, are called hotspot books. So what you do is you take a photocopy of each page of the book and then you cut out, you print out the photocopies and you cut out all the pertinent information or the pertinent characters or the per, uh, pertinent fact that's happening in the movement and then stick it back on the book with Velcro. So this provides visual references for some of my students with vision impairment. They can go up and show them closer. Oh, here's the hermit crab we're talking about. Here is the fish he came across. Or you can take the two of them and act out the scene. Um, for some of my younger students, it just kind of pulls their attention into the book a little more. Um, they get excited on who gets to pull off the next picture and hold it um, until I'm done reading. Another way I like to adapt books 
is by putting core words within the books. So for a while, people were putting each a symbol for each word. So for the sentence, the animals love the big red barn, they would have a symbol, the animals love the big red barn. But the current research that just came out is saying this is actually not beneficial for our students. So instead, I have been using core words within the books. So on this, this particular book, I have open next to all of our lift the flaps. So I'm modeling open. They have a device I'm modeling open on their device. Um, and also on every page of every book, I have turned the page so that the student can indicate that they want to turn the page. I can indicate that it's time to turn the page, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then another big thing that I love are environmental labels. So within a number of my classrooms right now, we are doing core words and letters of the week. Um, and with that, we're doing corresponding environmental labels. So the first week was obviously A, and our core word was all. So here are two different environmental labels that I put up, all of us and want all. So not only is this providing the visual for the students, it's also providing a visual for the staff to remind them of things they can model using our core words. And after the week is over, we don't take them down. So I think before school closed, we got all the way up to the letter G. So this one particular classroom has is covered in head to toe with environmental labels. Um, it helps promote early word recognition, early symbol recognition, and those core words that we're using throughout the day. So if you don't have easy holds, what you can do is you can actually just take the hair elastic and I can loop the hair elastic through and loop it back on the other side. And for smaller hands, it works a lot better. But same idea, it's just providing that grip for the students. The easy holds, you can actually buy them on Amazon, they're not too expensive, um, but they were sold out for a while. So I I'm not sure if they're back in stock yet. Um, what I do really like about the easy hold instead of the hair elastic is that these are easily disinfected, especially with everything going on right now. I think it's a sanitary choice. You can just clean them off with your Clorox wipes. Another way to build up a grip is with pipe insulation tubing. So you can just buy this at Home Depot or Lowe's and you can make a thicker grip for students who need it. You can also use Model Magic. So Model Magic is that clay that when you take it out of the package, it's really soft, and then you let it air dry and it hardens, but it doesn't harden like Play-Doh does. It hardens in more of a soft form that then can't be moved. So building up that grip on a fork, building that grip up on a stylus for a student using a communication device. And these right here are my newest Target dollar spot finds. Um, they are these pockets that become dry erasable. So what you can do is you can stick any worksheet inside of it and now this worksheet is a dry erase worksheet. Or you stick a page of a book inside of it and then when the student leaves at the end of a session or the end of the day, you can easily just disinfect this whole surface. Um, they come in a bunch of different colors. I plan on using one for each one of the classrooms I'm in. Um, also, save some paper a little bit and help the environment out. And one of my worst habits is going to stores and looking around and trying to figure out how I can use all the different things around the store as assistive text. This is my latest find. And these are just by Melissa and Doug and they're chalk holders. So they are increasing the grip of the chalk holders for our students that don't have the fine motor abilities to appropriately hold a piece of chalk. My preschoolers love these and they are so popular with them that they're constantly fighting over who gets to use them. So now these are seen as something cool and something different and something fun and not something that makes them stand out, which I think is a huge, huge thing, especially in those younger ages. So just a few little low tech tips and tricks that I have learned along the way. Um, buy a corner puncher. So you can buy these in the scrapbooking section of Michael's or any other craft store. Um, this is for when you're laminating different visuals or icons um, and you cut them out in squares. Then the edges become extremely sharp and can actually cut your skin. 
So if you have a corner punch, all you have to do is quickly punch off each corner instead of having to sit there with scissors and go around and around and around each corner multiple times. This is such a huge time saver, especially when you have lots of visuals to make. Another one is to use contact paper to reduce glare. So I have a number of students with cortical visual impairment and the glare off of laminated materials is distracting and makes their ability to visually access the materials much more difficult. Um, I also had this one amazing student who could somehow take anything that I laminated and at the time he was using a removable icon communication book. Um, he would take the symbols off and he would somehow line up the light in just the right way and was able to flick the light on a wall or on the ceiling or however he did it. I could never figure it out. Um, so we had to move to contact paper with him because it just became too much of a distraction. Um, he wasn't able to focus on his work and was more interested in how he could bounce the light off his laminated icons. Um, the one problem with contact paper is that you can't really just run it through a machine. It takes a lot longer and it's a lot less forgiving. Once it's on there, it's on there. There is some matte um, laminate out there. I am not a huge fan of it so far. I find that it still has a pretty significant glare on it. So with my students with CVI, we just hand contact paper everything. Um, they also make matte sleeves to stick in binders, and I find those a little bit better, but still not great as the original contact paper. The dollar store and Target bargain section are dangerous for me. Thankfully, Target was closed for a while and I couldn't buy anything, but they are back open and they have some amazing stuff right now, including these that we were talking about earlier. They were, I think, two or three dollars each. And one of my favorite all-time finds are these adhesive pocket squares. So you can actually see them behind me. So I have a row of uh, fringe vocabulary on my core. We were talking about farm animals this week. Um, and I can just easily remove my icons from these adhesive pocket squares and stick them back in or change them. Um, and they come in packs of 20 and they were $3. And so in a bunch of my classrooms, I have them all, all throw the classroom for environmental labels, but these are just them. They're super easy to use and they're just giant stickers. They fit icons um, that are three inch by three inch. Another, this is one of my 2 a.m. I can't sleep um, ideas that I came up with. I had just gotten a new puppy and of course bought all of the puppy stuff. And one of the things I happened to buy was a waste bag dispenser. So, you know, you put the roll of waste bags in here and you pull them up through this hole. But what I figured out is that you can also use it as a switch cord holder. So all when I need a longer switch cord, I can easily pull it out. And when I am done with it, I easily can pull it right back in. And this will prevent students grabbing the cords, wheelchairs running over them and breaking them. Um, and it just kind of cleans up the whole environment. I can't stand when I look at my students' wheelchairs and they're just covered in cords and covered in all this extra stuff. Um, and another little trip, tip, ugh, trip um, is to use binder clips. So all of my cords that I have stored are stored using binder clips. So then I have back in my office at work, I have little push pins up along my bulletin board and they just easily hang right on my bulletin board. So when I need a USB-C, I can just pull this one right off and use it and it easily wraps up. You're not dealing with the knots and everything that come with cords. All right, so for the next few minutes, I'm going to have as many people that can access this as they can. We're going to do a Google form. I want you guys to think of as many ways as you can that you could use a pool noodle within your environment, within the setting that you're currently working in. So what you need to do is click on this tiny URL or type it right in, um, and it'll bring you to a Google form to fill out, and I'm gonna give everyone about three minutes to fill that out. All right, so 
let's take a look at some of the answers that you guys came up with. So for physical, um, a balance beam, good grip, grasp, um, increase the size of an item to be gripped, holding utensils, covering sharp edges on furniture, paint brush holder to build it up, for vision to prop up an iPad, play I spy, batting a balloon, headbands, I think someone wrote. That's a great idea. I never thought of that one. Um, for hearing, pass the message telephone, auditory feedback while talking through a new pool noodle, playing drums with the pool noodle, behavioral emotional, um, squeeze ball for input, divider, spatial boundary, cut it up and use it as a craft. Um, these actually make really cool paintbrushes if you cut up pool noodles. Um, and some other ideas you guys had with obstacle courses, pencil grips used for positioning, TheraBand on a chair. So these are some awesome, awesome ideas you guys came up with. And this just kind of shows all of the different things that we can do with something that is so cheap and so easy to be found. Um, so you can buy a pool noodle at the dollar store and cut it up. And then now you have four pool noodles and can do all of these different things with them. So to move on to some mid-tech options, um, my favorite piece of mid-tech equipment is a step-by-step -step with levels. You can buy these from EagleNet. Um, and what it does is it provides a sequential message. So I'll show you guys what I have programmed on here. Good morning, everyone. It's Abby. How's everyone doing today? So it's providing that sequential message to elicit that back and forth conversation pattern, um, which is huge. I feel like a lot of our students with complex communication needs are just being spoken to, and they're not being um, engaged within a meaningful conversation. What's really cool about these step-by-steps is that there's levels on them. So if I switch over to level three, my message now says, That's it. And using this with students who use partner assisted scanning or partner assisted auditory visual scanning number three on all of their step by steps is always that's it that's what i want but if we then come across somebody new in the hallway i can quickly switch back to number one and we are back to our original message this one has three levels on it you can also plug a switch into it to use it and as an external switch um, talk blocks are these small squares at the bottom of the screen, and they are durable but can only record one message. They use batteries. Uh, I have a lot of families that use these or any of the next three ones um, as ways to ask for things within the household. So I have some families that are using them right outside their bathroom. So if a student needs to ask to use the bathroom, if they need help or assistance in the bathroom, all they have to go over is hit that button. I need to use the bathroom and then people can hear them. Um, I also have used these with some of my students with emotional behavioral challenges um, who when they are upset they kind of just shut down and they don't really know what to do. So instead of asking them to then come up with a way to ask for help all they have to do now is hit the button that says I need space or I need a walk or whatever is written into their behavior plan. Um, this is huge because it's they're probably overstimulated at this point and asking them to do another task on top of everything else is just too much for them. Talk bricks are another option similar to talk blocks. Um, these ones are rechargeable and they're durable and connect together. So I have, and they're also magnetic. So I have some families that have them up on refrigerators. So they have some down the side that say, I want, I need, help me, and then some nouns. So like, I need juice, and then they can work on um, sequentially creating those independent messages. The least expensive of all of these are called recordable answer buzzers, and you can buy these just on Amazon. They are super cheap. They are $15 for four of them. Um, the video, audio quality is not amazing on them, but they're still, I think, helpful throughout the classroom um, and they're a lot cheaper for families to buy. They can also only record one message unlike the step-by-steps, which can record those sequential messages. Another great piece of mid-tech um, is a time timer. 
I'm sure almost everyone has seen one of these, but what a lot of people don't know is that there's three different product options for this. You can have the physical product. There's also a tablet app and an online website. So I have a lot of teachers that pull the online website up on their smart boards and during trade-in and say, we have five minutes for trade-in when all of the red is gone, trade-in is done. So the way this works is you set the timer and as time progresses, the red slowly disappears until it is all white. And it's providing that visual representation of time for our students that maybe don't understand time yet or just need that extra visual support. Another great one is a talking photo book. So you can record a message that goes with each picture. So I've used this for students who have gone on vacation. I ask their parents to then send in pictures and we create a talking photo book after. Um, it works on some great language skills and recall. So each picture they press then talks about that picture and it, they seem to really enjoy just bringing it around to their peers or other classes or staff members to talk about their vacation. It's also really great for students who you know are about to go into the hospital for a procedure or they'll be in there for an extended period of time. Um, I've made one of these for a student that was going to be in there for a few months and we're likely going to be um, on a vent. So they wouldn't be able to verbally communicate. So we made this awesome talking photo book about who he was. I, you know, my name is blah, blah, blah. My favorite things are Mickey Mouse Clubhouse and cars. And it provided him a way for him to interact with his nurses or for his family to show who he was outside of the hospital. This is an alternate. This right here is an alternate. Um, it is a switch adapted spinner. You can put lots and lots and lots of different things around the rim and be able to have, give your students some independence. So this one just happens to have the dice on it. So we have used this to play Yahtzee, but then the student has to spin the spinner 15 times each turn, which can be really physically taxing for a lot of kids um, and also difficult for some of our other students to wait through it. So a lot of the times they'll be like, all right, you're in charge of dice number one. I'll be in charge of the rest of the dice. You spin dice one and then we go through like that. Um, these are all removable. So sometimes I'll put on the white side and I'll put Arctic cards on the outside. So then when the student spins the spinner, whatever it lands on, there is our target word. Let's say our target word 10 times together things like that. You could put different exercises on it if you're doing a gross motor activity. The students think it's just the coolest thing ever. So it has a little button in the corner down here. Um, you can also plug an external switch in so students can use our external switches and also access this. Another great thing about this is that a lot of them aren't perfect. So this spinner in particular typically lands right there. So if I know when we play sorry, I always put the sorry cards right there because those are the ones the kids think are the most fun anyway and it makes the game go a lot faster. Um, another one is a power link. And this is a little more expensive than some of the stuff we've been talking about. Um, so what it does is you're able to plug in any device with an on off switch and then it becomes switch accessible. And there's three different modes on this one. So there's direct, so as long as they hold down that switch, that device will stay on. There's latch, they hit their switch, the device stays on until they hit their switch a second time and it shuts off. Um, and then timed seconds, so they hit their switch and it stays on for X amount of time that you have pre-programmed in there. Um, this picture is of the new power link that exists. It's not my favorite upgrade that I've ever seen. Um, and it's probably for good reasons though. They put in, I think, some safety features and you can no longer plug in a Vitamix or a KitchenAid to it. I think it was taking too much power, um, but there is still some old school power links. They are teal um, that you can plug just about anything into because they were made in the 90s. Um, and then a cheaper option to that, show you this one. I actually just made this today. And what I did, where is my switch, was I stuck a battery interrupter inside of a bubble blower. So, and then I zip tied the little lever that you have to push to make the bubbles blow. So now when I plug my switch, it 
welcome to my bubble blower. Hit my switch. It turns it on. The bubbles do eventually blow, but it was on its side, so they're not going to smell. But it's just a great way for students to access everyday tools and not have to pay. Because if you bought this pre-adapted, it would be about three hundred dollars, whereas a battery interrupter is about ten dollars. And the only downfall to this is it only works while I'm holding down the switch. So like that direct method on the um, power link before you have to hold it down. There's a secondary device you can plug in called a switch and latch timer um, that you can buy to make it timed or um, latched like on the power link. And the last one, we actually just got our first one at Valley and I'm very excited about it. It's called the C-Pen. It provides a real time text to speech. So it looks just like a typical pen and you just roll it over text and it um, provides that text to speech output. Um, you can plug headphones right in. It's really discreet. So some of our high school students use it. Um, it also provides a built-in dictionary and you can set it to test mode so that they can't then use the dictionary or other features while they're taking an exam. All right, the smart home. Um, this is changing the world of assistive technology as we know it. So one of the coolest things about smart home devices is that they are do understand synthesized speech. So you can use it with a step-by-step -step or with a um, speech generating device. So I'm going to show you guys a quick video. All right, I'm just gonna warn you for the first video, um, one of my students does not like Alexa, um, so he screams in the video but you should be able to still hear the rest of it. Okay. Alexa, what is the weather today? Oh. In Bill Recess, it's 40 degrees Fahrenheit with cloudy skies. Oh. Today, it's overshowers. Yeah. The high is 53 and the low of 48 Alexa, tell me a joke. Why are pennies so volatile to each other? Alexa, what time is it? And that was my sister again using Alexa. Um, as much as I love Alexa, it has been a pain with my sister. Um, if she thinks she rules the house, so if she doesn't want to listen to the music, she'll tell Alexa to change the station, even if we're all liking the music. If she doesn't want to talk to us, she'll turn the volume of Alexa up. Um, she actually set a timer for 2 a.m. once. We None of us were in the room with her at the time, and she set a timer for 2 a.m. So at 2 a.m., Alexa went off in our kitchen. Um, whether or not she intentionally set it for 2 a.m., I don't think we'll ever know, but she still laughs about it. So I have a feeling it was pretty intentional. Um, some so ideas for use, asking about the weather, telling a joke, reading audiobooks, DJing a class, or turning on and off appliances with smart outlets. All right, so um, this project is called Project Understood. Um, we're not going to watch the video of it, but um, you'll be able to see it in the handouts. Um, what it is, is the Canadian Down Syndrome Society is pairing with Google Project Understood um, to be able to better understand smart home devices for individuals who have diverse speech patterns. Um, and there's also another project called Google Project Euphonia, which is working with the ALS Development Institute. Um, and what they're doing is they're having these individuals come in and read different phrases and sentences, um, and then using that to improve their AI so that it better understands um, speech patterns that may be diverse from the typical speech pattern. It's a really cool video if you have time to watch it later. All right, I think we will do a few questions. All right, one of the questions that's come in is, can you explain boom cards? Sure thing, and it's been the greatest thing I have ever found since virtual learning. Um, what it does is it's an online platform that you can create card decks of, and they're interactive for students to use. So every week I go in and I make a core word and letter of the week boom deck to use in my classroom. 
um, and you can put in YouTube videos, you can ask questions on it, you can do multiple choice, you can do fill in the blank. Um, and what's really cool about it is that it links right into Google Classroom. So you assign it to a student and then I can track how they're doing on the Zoom card deck. I can track how long they tried. I can track how many times they tried. I can track their success rate and it just keeps the data for me, which has been really, really helpful. Um, and it's really cool to be able to collaborate with teachers since we're all working virtually, we can together work on Boom Card Deck. All right, another question. Um, someone says, thank you for the great ideas. Asking as an OT here, does a chalk holder promote a palm or grasp? Um, I use it more for my students with CP who have fine motor difficulties. So I have one student that he can make a grasp, but not on something as small as a pencil. So I'm going to try it out with him as soon as we're back in person and um, see how he does with it. All right, another comment here. Um, you can also store cords in an empty toilet paper roll um, for the cardboard. Uh, all right, and then there are triangular chalk holders there as well. All right, so a couple comments we've had. And that looks like all the questions we have at the moment. Perfect. Um, I love hearing everyone else's ideas and learning new things. So if you guys have any suggestions along the way, I would love to hear them. All right, so we are going to move into some Google Chrome extensions and built in accessibility features. So for text-to-speech, my favorite one currently to use is Announceify. Um, what it does is it transforms a web page into a less visually distracting document by removing all the ads and pictures, and it blurs out the paragraph except for the one that is currently being read aloud. Um, a downfall is that it can only read the entire page, not just specific portions, which can be frustrating for some students, and it doesn't highlight the word as it speaks it. Um, there was another one called Speak It that we were using a lot, but um, as we were talking about earlier, they were no longer updating it. And also, um, Google realized they were violating some of their privacy terms. So, um, we no longer recommend uh, speaking. So, for spelling and grammar, there's kind of two main areas that people go to. The first one is Grammarly, and the second one is Ginger. So, these are both extensions that you can add to Chrome. Um, so they both work across the web no matter where you are. So if I'm typing a status on Facebook, my Grammarly is running. Um, you can copy and paste full papers into their website for a full spelling and grammar check. Um, one of the pros to Grammarly is that it gives an explanation of what needs to be fixed. So in this example down here, I purposely used the wrong version of there, and it told me that you need to check your word usage and that this is the correct version of there. Ginger does not do that. But what Ginger does that Grammarly does not is that it has built-in translation features and a dictionary and thesaurus. I tend to lean towards more towards Grammarly because I like the feedback that it's giving students um, and not just telling them what's wrong, but telling them why it's wrong. I also like that it's currently beta testing in Google Drive um, because we are a Google school, so that it is working within Google Drive across slides and docs and sheets. Um, I have a funny feeling that Grammarly in the end is going to win out over Ginger just because they are in control of Google at the moment and Ginger is not. Another great extension is Resumer. So what it does is it summarizes an entire web page and allows for different levels of summarization. So there's this long network article, Wilmington Paul Dem for wins Food Network Outrageous Pumpkin. And it was about two and a half pages long. And I set it to the highest summarization setting and it just produced these two paragraphs for me. Um, it also removes all pictures and ads. One of the downfalls to this one is that it sometimes does leave out important information. So it's just important to read it over before you give it to a student. But this is a great way to modify curriculum um, for those students that need less wordy paragraphs and such. Another one is Magiscroll, um, and it takes out the ads and descriptions, and it also allows you to change the font size and color scheme within the document. So for students that have vision impairments that maybe need um, more high contrast, you're able to do that right within Magiscroll and make the text bigger. 
this is my newest find thanks to TikTok. I never thought I would ever be on TikTok, but there is a really great hashtag called Teachers Tech. So if you're ever bored, check it out. And I learned about this extension called Automatically. And what Automatically does is you upload a PDF document within your Google Drive. From there, you click Automatically and this little sidebar will pop up and it will ask you which ones of the questions that they found within your PDF would you like created into a Google form. So it's taking out all the legwork for you and it's then taking this document with your input and creating a Google form that you can then send out to your students. And this is also great for students where this would be really overwhelming for them, all of the different fonts and color coding and everything. Um, just in a Google form, it's simple text. They can use their text to speech and speech to text within the Google form. I think this is a total game changer. Um, we'll see how long it's updated, but it's great right now. Um, unfortunately, my school district blocked automatically as of right now, um, but I was able to use it on my personal account and I'm hoping to get that bypassed pretty soon. Um, another great one I learned on TikTok was print friendly and PDF, and it takes any web page, removes the ad, and creates it into a PDF document. What's really cool about this one oops, is that on each section of text, it gives you this little trash can icon and you can delete it out of the PDF. So this I think was a web address that the students needed need. So I was able to just quickly delete it, download it as a PDF and send it on its way to my students. Um, this also prevents, you know, sometimes ads are not always the most appropriate. This takes out all those ads, they can be distracting and they're just getting the simplified text. And when it's in a PDF, it is a lot easier to use with screen readers, I find. Another great one is called Custom Cursor, and you turn your cursor into a variety of different things. So throughout the day, um, when I'm working with my students, I use this red triangle, um, especially with my students with CVI, so that they can hopefully better visually track what I am pointing to. And there's a lot of cool ones too. So the minions, you can make your cursor a minion, you can make your cursor Johnny Depp, you can make your cursor a unicorn, um, so it's a great way to engage students. Where's the minion going up? Oh, look, the minion's looking over here at this picture. That's it. Another great option for virtual learning is a website called Edpuzzles. What Edpuzzles does is you upload a video, whether it's through YouTube or a personal video, and you're able to edit it and crop out portions you don't want, make it a little shorter. Um, and you can also add in multiple choice and short answer questions within the video. So when the video student's watching the video, it automatically pause and ask them the questions that you have programmed in there, um, which is great for engagement. Um, I use it a lot when I'm trying to model some core words. We'll pause and be like, go, like go dog, go. And it's providing that um, prompt not only for my students but for the staff members to um, to model on their devices. You can create a class and be able to see which students have watched the videos and answered questions. Um, I have not played around with this yet. We use Google Classroom and it doesn't quite interface quite right um, and it's too confusing to have so many different classrooms all open at once. And this is a relatively new tool it's called Scribble. And it allows you to annotate directly on a web page and then save to your Scribble library. So um, as educators, we currently get free educators accounts and then you can add students within that account. And what you're able to do is highlight, add comments, change text colors, underline things, um, use text-to-speech, translate, and dictionary. So if I open a page and I annotate on it and I hit save, I'm then able to come back to it later and those same annotations are still there. And then the last thing, I actually just did this worksheet today with some students. We were working on problem solving. Um, you can take a PDF file, and if you open it in Google Slides, delete all the slides but one, and then go to File, Page Setup, and set the size of the page as 8.5 by 11, you can then insert the PDF as a background so that the students can't move it at all. And then you can put your own little text boxes in and send it off to students. So all the students have to do is type in their answers as they go. 
And because the PDF is the background and it's the same size as a piece of paper, they're not able to move it around. Um, and then when you send it to students, you can use Google Classroom, which will automatically then make a new copy for each student or you can make multiple copies and send the links out to students as well. So I am working remotely while some of our students are in person. So today during our social skills, we were working on problem solving and I was able to pull this up on the board in the multiple classrooms I was in um, and walk them through the worksheets that they were then able to do on their own, on their desks as well. Um, I actually meant to turn these guys on for you guys. So um, in Google Slides, there are built-in accessibility features, including this closed captioning. Um, I find this one to be relatively accurate. That's not to say there aren't some crazy absurd things that it thinks I'm saying. Um, I apologize, I normally turn this on right when I start um, because I feel that it can be beneficial for a number of people. Um, it's in Google Docs, so you can use speech to text and text to speech just on its own without any extensions built in. All right, we are going to quickly move into some iOS features. Um, Apple has done such an amazing, amazing, amazing job taking feedback um, and listening to what people have said. That's not to say they're perfect. That's not to say that there isn't a lot of work still to be done, but they really have taken into consideration what people have been saying. So with iOS 13, there was a huge, huge, huge upgrade to access accessibility. So anything you see in purple on these slides will be a part of iOS 13. So older iPads might not be able to do them. Um, I think one of the biggest changes that's not really that big, but it means a lot is that it's now part of this iPad setup process. So if you set up an iPad as a brand new iPad, and then you're not restoring it from an old iPad, when it asks you, it asks you for your time zone, it asks you for what language you wanted it, it asks you what accessibility features you want to set up. It's just part of the everyday. It's just part of the setup process now. Um, and it also now has its own tab in the settings app. So I think this is really empowering for the disability community um, that, you know, accessibility is just another function of the iPad. It's not something different. It's not something you can add on. It's not something that is all this extra work. It's just part of the iPad. Um, and the big thing with iPads is that they're all about customization. And when I'm talking about iPads, I'm also talking about um, iPhones and iPod touches as well. Um, I do want to show you guys this video because this girl, young lady, I should say, uh, she's just absolutely incredible. Um, I really look up to her. People think that having a disability is a barrier. But that's not the way I see it. You can catch up with friends. Ready? You can capture a moment with your family. One face, small face, focus lock. And you can start the day bright and early. You can take a trip to somewhere new. Three miles to the summit. You can concentrate on every word of a story. A bird began to sing. Jack opened his eyes. You can take the long way home. edit a film like this one when technology is designed for everyone it lets anyone do what they love including me That amazing young lady's name is Sadie, and she was actually hired by Apple um, 
after seeing some of the great work she was doing. So she is the one that created that entire commercial, all using two switches in a head array. So it really shows the power of accessibility. And now she's an amazing film editor. So some built-in accessibility features. One is text-to-speech. Um, there are different options for this. So speak selection, it's just whatever you highlight. So if I hold my finger down, hit select, and I can select how much text I want highlighted, and then just would hit speak. Speak screen is typically swipe three fingers down, and it will read the entire contents of the screen. You can also set it to highlight the content. So it will underline whatever sentence is being spoken and highlight the current word being read so that the um, individual is able to follow along as they go. You can turn on typing feedback. So what this does is when an individual hits the letter P, you can have it say P, or you can set it to words. So they type the word pig, and when they hit the space bar, it says pig. And then if it has to autocorrect to piglet, it will say autocorrect piglet. Um, and there are also some predictions. You can have it set to read your predictions. Um, assistive touch is one that I actually had to use for quite a long time. Um, all it does is it puts a little white dot somewhere on your screen and you can move it around. Um, and it's just quick shortcuts to a bunch of accessibility features. So the mute slider on the side of my phone broke. So I was able to put in a feature there that just when I click the white dot, I could click mute and unmute. Um, I know the mute does break all the time. So it's just super helpful for me. You within here, you can create custom gestures. So if you have a student that maybe is not able to zoom in using two fingers, like the default setting, um, you can make a custom gesture. So maybe three taps means zoom in, or a tap and a swipe means zoom in. Another great feature are these touch accommodations. So for students that maybe slide their hand around the iPad, before they hit their final resting spot, um, you can put on hold duration. So they have to hold on that selection for X amount of time before it is um, taken as their selection. Ignore and repeat are great for individuals with motor impairments um, who maybe repetitively tap on things. We also like to call these happy tappers for our students who like to stim on the sounds of certain things. You can put on an ignore and repeat so that they can't repetitively hit the same button over and over and over and over again. Um, tap assistance is automatically turned on in everyone's phone. Um, it came out with one of the bug updates and I think it threw a lot of people off. Um, um, it's when you are on a web page, if you swipe down, it'll bring the entire contents of your web page down towards the middle so that it's easier to touch them. Um, another tap assistance is putting your whole hand on the screen but it's only accepting your initial or your final touch. So if you don't have that glove, you can also use this. Um, another feature that I use frequently is your keyboard shortcuts. So I have my phone set that when I type HH, it automatically corrects to heading home so that I can text whoever I need to that I am heading home. One of the biggest changes to iOS 13 is the inclusion of voice control. So now you can control a map or an iPad or an iPhone completely with your voice. And what's really cool about it is that it responds to synthesized speech. So if you have a student that using, is using a speech generating device, they're still able to control their iPad using their speech generating device in an indirect way. So there are three different ways it does this. The first one is by item numbers. I'm gonna show you a quick video that I made um, using item numbers. So it puts a number next to every single thing on that screen that is selectable. So then if I wanted to, you know, open Safari, I could say 13, 17, 52, 21, and it'll open it up, click on the top URL bar, type in what I want and execute, execute the whole command. Um, item labels work the same way, except instead of numbers, there's words and numbered grid sets it up um, in a grid-like fashion. Um, you could say grid one, it'll then zoom in to just grid one, and then two, it would zoom in just to that part until you get close enough that it can tell what you want to select. Just like with um, the button before, you're able to create custom gestures. Another cool feature is the attention awareness. So you can set it so it only is listening and 
executing those commands while you're looking at the screen. So if you happen to say the word Safari, it's not going to open up Safari for you with, unless you're looking directly at the screen. So here is our video using voice control. 32. Eight. Dog. Ten. Twenty one. Scroll down. Forty six. Long press 22. Six. Go home. Open photos. So that was showing how I was able to look up a photo and save it to my photo roll just by using my voice. Another physical access way um, that iOS is wonderful is with switch control. There is built-in switch control within iOS. Um, it can be difficult and time consuming you can set it to a bunch of different settings, but it's definitely a learning curve and not something you can pick up super quick. Um, but there are some apps that have their own switch controls that work independently of the built-in options. One thing to be wary of is that you can't have both on at the same time. So I can't have a Help Kids Learn app work with their switch control and also have the built-in switch control working at the same time. It's an impeding signal and they're not able to do it. Um, just like before, you can create rough custom recipes similar to voice control. So in terms of input methods, um, with the newer iPads, they come with a USB-C input. Um, that's how you charge it. So you can put in a USB switch directly into that. Um, I haven't found a wonderful USB switch yet, USB-C switch yet, um, but we'll talk about Tapio, which is a USB that you can put a converter on. In terms of Bluetooth, this used to be the end-all, be-all. It was the Bluetooth. The so Bluetooth and I have a love-hate relationship. Um, when it works, it works wonderfully. When it doesn't work, it is very difficult, especially when you have a classroom full of students all using them. Um, then it gets confused on which iPad you're pairing with it. Now you can change the name and everything, but it's still challenging. And I find that the internal pieces of it break really easily. Um, and normally just outside the warranty window. Um, that one that you can plug into the charging port, directly into the charging port, even on the older lightning cable um, inputs are the Tapio, is the best one that I think, and I think it's the most reliable. So the Tapio is a USB plug, and it plugs into then, you would plug it into an adapter, which then plugs directly into the iPad. Um, and there is no Bluetooth signal, there's no worrying about whether or not it's going to pair. All you have to do is just plug that switch in and you are ready to go. Um, sometimes, for a while, the creator of Tapio was not allowing it to work with some other company's apps, but it seems like that is kind of on the, the downslope now. Um, I haven't really run across many apps recently that don't work with Tapio. You can use your screen as a switch and your Apple Watch as a switch with ProLoco. Um, which is really cool. You know, you could just tap on your iPad, your iWatch, and control your iPad. Another feature is you can use your camera as a switch. So when you turn your head to the left, you know, that's like hitting a switch. Um, turn your head to the right, things like that. Um, I have yet to make this work. Um, I had a coworker walk in up to me in the therapy office, and I was just tapping my head back and forth, back and forth, and they wanted to make sure I was okay. 
All right, another cool physical access is mouse control. So now that it's a USB-C to plug into an iPad or an iDevice, um, you can use mice um, or a mouse to control the iPad super easily. You just plug it in, it's ready to go. There's also the quick path keyboards, which now automatically comes in installed on your device. And it allows you to just swipe your finger across the screen to type. So instead of typing T, H, E, I would just swipe from T to H to E, and it would spell the word the. Um, to get it, all you have to do is click the world icon in the bottom left corner when you're typing something, and it'll pop up. All right, in terms of vision, you can change the display and text size. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't work in Safari right now unless you put it in reader mode, which we'll chat about in a minute. Um, voice over, so it reads aloud what is selected and can read aloud text messages, apps, memes, etc., etc. The new feature is with the camera. So now when you have voice over turned on and you hold up your camera, it'll tell you how many faces are in the picture when the camera is tilted. And if you're really good about going in and labeling your pictures with people's names, it can also tell you who is in the picture. Um, it can detect if other languages are being used and it'll ask you if you want to switch to it as well. This magnifier I have used with my own parents um, who refused to get readers. Um, they were opening their camera and then zooming in that way, but you can actually just open a magnifier right in accessibility and it acts as a magnifying glass. Um, it doesn't get all blurry like it does on the camera. Um, the speech to text in the new iOS 13 is much stronger and easier to edit. So I could say change I ate grilled fish to I ate grilled cheese and it's able to do that without having to go in and find where the error in the word is. You can add custom words um, and it gives you word and emoji suggestions. Zoom is this picture over here. You triple click three fingers and it will create this little box that you can then drag around the screen to zoom in. And then guided access is the greatest creation that Apple has ever made, in my humble opinion, because it allows you to lock a student into one app. Not only can you lock it into one app, but you can also lock it into a number of apps. So I'm a big proponent of this iPad is used for communication and communication only. So most of the time my students are locked into only their communication application. But I've come across a number of students that use multiple communication applications, whether they're using Notes and Proloco and Proloco for text. There now I can lock it so they can only get to those three apps. You can also gray out certain areas of the screen. So this is great if, say, you want to gray out the area. If they're playing, your kid's playing a game, you can gray out the um, ad bar so they're not able to click the ads. Also great for my students, I like to call Houdinis, who can figure out how to edit no matter how much security I put on their device. So I have a student that I have to shut off device, the uh, editing capabilities within the system settings on the iPad. I have to shut off and put a passcode on the editing device on the application itself. And I have to gray out to the area where that would exist. Um, so that it's three levels and she's still able to figure it out sometimes. I don't know yet how yet, but it's now three levels she has to get through if she wants to move things around. I have had a student in the past who changed every single word on their talker to a dinosaur. Um, and it was very traumatizing because it was not backed up, but in terms of hearing, you can now type to Siri. Um, you can also set visible and vibrating alerts. I actually use these vibrating alerts myself. So when my mom texts, my phone vibrates differently than when my friends text. Um, you can also set it so that when you get a notification, an LED light flashes. Um, also, closed captioning, and what's really cool is now closed captioning works with podcasts. I'm a huge podcast junkie, um, so I just found this super interesting that they are now closed captioned as well. So, in terms of other, this is called reader mode, which I mentioned briefly before. So, when you're on a web page within Safari, next to the URL, you'll see three little bars. And when you click those three little bars, you enter reader mode. And like some of the extensions we talked about before, what it does is it removes all ads and distractions and gives you just the text. While you're in reader mode, you can change the font size and the color and zoom in um, to be able to better read it. So, you know, when you get to app, those websites that you really need the information on, but it keeps opening pop-ups, 
I put it in reader mode, then they can't send me those pop-ups and I don't get super annoyed. You can also put reader mode when you're using some Safari on your Mac as well. So the control center is where you access all of these accessibility. So once you set them up, you're able to add them to your control panel. So on the newest update, you just swipe down from the top right corner and to be able to get to these shortcuts. So you can put your magnifier here, your text size, your guided access, um, your hearing aids, everything right here in this control center for super easy access. So for students that are using the built-in switch scanning, I always have it as an option so that I can easily turn it on and off. All right, quickly make it through Apple Watch. Um, Apple Watch has hepatic features. It allows you to tell time through physical touch understand directions and receive notifications so if you ever have google uh, apple maps running on your phone giving you directions and you have your apple watch on you'll notice that it taps you a certain number of times to turn left and then taps you a certain number of times to turn right i believe it taps you six times in a row to turn right and two times for left but i'm not 100 percent sure on that one um, you can also use voiceover and then this feature on the left is noise. So what it will do is you'll get a notification if the decibel level is too high. And it gives you the reminder that long-term exposure to sounds can be dangerous at that level. Um, I think this needs to be on every single one of our kids' Apple Watches. Um, just as a quick little reminder that things can be too loud. As I said before, you can use it as an external switch for Pro Loco. And then when you're setting is up you can say you're in a wheelchair and it'll say time to roll instead of time to stand um, and it will let you instead of tracking a walk tracking how far you roll all right so that is all we have time for today um but if anyone has any other questions i am happy to answer them all right, so another question about the boom cards. Have you made your own boom cards? And if so, how did you do it? How did you learn? Um, all that good stuff. Yes, I have. Um, that's kind of been my summer project. I have a little boom card store that I create my boom cards and sell them in. Um, it's, boom cards is pretty self-explanatory. Once you learn how to do it, it's pretty easy. So when you download boom cards and you go to make your first deck, it actually shows you step by step how to do everything. And then there's some awesome Facebook pages um, where I've learned a lot of tips and tricks on how to do things as well. Um, but if you have any specific questions about Bloom Cards, please feel free to email me and I'm happy to answer them.